Hello, my name is Bob McKenzie, and you may know me as the Hockey Insider at TSN, but I'm speaking to you today more as a parent who's become all too familiar with the issue of concussions in sports. Now, I have two sons who've had varying degrees of experiences with concussions, and I'm pained to say I know far more about this insidious condition than I ever would have liked. My eldest son, Mike, is currently a 21-year-old sophomore at St. Lawrence University, playing NCAA Division I hockey on a scholarship. Now, he suffered a significant concussion four years ago while playing junior A hockey. For two months, he had post-concussion symptoms, and like many players, he wondered each day whether he was going to be normal again, if he was going to be able to ever play again. To have headaches or a lack of concentration is one thing, and not a good thing either, but it's that fear of not knowing when or if you'll get better and be able to resume your playing career that can often be the worst byproduct of this injury. The best way I can explain it is that a darkness envelops those afflicted, and it's very tough to shake. Fortunately for my son, Mike, he's back playing after a three-month absence, and I'm happy to report he hasn't had any serious problems, touch wood, since then. Now, my younger son, Sean, who's now 18, has not been so fortunate. He's not been able to play any contact sports for almost four years. He currently has a low-level but constant headache, yes, every minute of every day for almost four years. Now, it's much better now than it was before, but it has had a major impact on his life. His concussion history started when he was just four years old, and a friend pulled him off some monkey bars, and he ended up unconscious on the ground. Since then, he's had a knack and a misfortune for sustaining far too many raps to the head. He banged his head on the side of the pool being chased by his brother. He smacked his head on the frozen ground in the school play yard. He did a face plant while on rollerblades and knocked himself out. He was cross-checked in the head in a lacrosse game and elbowed in the head in a hockey game. Now, in each of those instances, he suffered a concussion. But not once did any symptoms occur beyond the day of the incident. Now, knowing concussion protocols from my involvement with pro hockey as I do, we always held him out of any activity that could pose any danger. He returned to play without any issues at all. But all of that changed in December of 2003, when he was involved in a hockey fight. He was not knocked out, but he did take a couple of punches to the face. It seemed pretty harmless at the time. But in the wake of that, he suffered a variety of post-concussion-like symptoms, and it was treated as such. Long story short, and believe me, it's a very long story, Sean's injury turned out to be less about concussion per se and more about a migraine-related condition that, for lack of a better term, is called chronic daily headache syndrome. According to the Mayo Clinic, it afflicts 4% of all North American female teens and 2% of all North American male teens. It's brought on by a minor head trauma or sometimes an infection like mononucleosis. Now, there isn't anything as a family we haven't tried to get rid of these headaches, but the good news is they are gradually receding and perhaps one day, Sean will be headache-free. But his experiences have been traumatic nonetheless. For a time, in the first year, when he thought he was simply concussed, he was unquestionably depressed. He was not able to be active because that is the initial treatment for post-concussion syndrome. He gained weight, he had difficulty functioning at school, and because he wasn't able to play on his sports teams, he lost his identity and social standing, if you will. For a kid who loved to play hockey in the winter and lacrosse in the summer, and whose life revolved around the sports teams he played on, well, you can't even imagine the negative impact it had on him. But he's worked through it. He's a great kid with a great outlook on life. And because the Whitby Minor Hockey Association has non-contact house league hockey, he's now been able to return to the game he loves, albeit not nearly at the level he would like to play. But he's doing great, and he's now aiming to get into my business and try and steal my job. Now, I'm not so naive to think there isn't some bitterness on his part, that he missed a big part of his life growing up. And as long as he has had the headaches, he has a constant reminder of all of that. But he's dealing with it. And I'm happy to report he's as happy and well-adjusted young man as he could be. So that is my personal frame of reference on the issue of concussions. My personal experiences with head trauma have reinforced to me just how serious this issue is, how it can affect people and families on so many levels. And you know, it's also heightened my awareness of just how common these stories are. I can't tell you how many minor hockey games I've been at where I've seen players concussed on one shift and back out the next shift. In some cases, people, and by people, I mean the players themselves, the coaches, the parents, are willfully ignorant, thinking that if they don't acknowledge the concussion problem, there is no problem. You know, out of sight, out of mind. We know, of course, that it is foolishness and neglectful and only going to even cause greater problems to adopt those attitudes. But there are still many who simply do not understand concussions, how to identify them, how to treat them, and we all must continue to do everything possible to heighten the awareness of this.
I know concussions are a major problem in minor hockey because I see it and I hear it firsthand. Because people are aware of my experiences, I often get phone calls and emails from worried parents of players who are dealing with the same thing I had to deal with. Now, I'm happy to pass along my experiences and provide a referral to someone to see Dr. Karen Johnson or some other expert close to where they live. I know far too many kids who, like my son, are no longer playing because of concussions. I also know kids who are playing and maybe they shouldn't be. All we can do is educate as many people as possible to the dangers of concussion, how to identify them, how to treat them. But based on my own experiences, I would also suggest this. Make sure there aren't other issues beyond the concussion itself. My advice to any parent of any kid suffering concussion symptoms would be to rule out other potential problems. Head trauma can also result in skeletal or muscular injuries, particularly in the neck area. Some of these injuries can produce the same symptoms as post-concussion syndrome. So even after the brain heals, the symptoms persist. Now one has to be very careful when seeking out medical treatment when concussed. But solid chiropractic, soft tissue, active release therapy, massage therapy, <clears throat> excuse me, all of these things can be helpful in ruling out issues above and beyond the actual brain trauma. So that's my personal experience with concussions. Now, here's my professional experience. As someone who follows the NHL day in and day out, I am disturbed to report that more and more NHL players are getting concussions. More and more NHL players are getting multiple concussions. More and more NHL players are dealing with serious consequences from concussions. I don't want to be an alarmist, but recent experiences in the NFL suggest there can be some truly horrific long-term effects from this concussion plague in pro sports. I fear there may be a terrible day of reckoning for NHL players sometime in the future with huge quality of life issues for many who have suffered from multiple concussions and tried to play through them. We know, of course, the notion that you can play through a concussion, it's ludicrous, but players are doing it. Concussion is still a misunderstood injury in the NHL. When a player has a knee or a shoulder injury, he simply cannot play, and it's evident for everyone to see. When a player has a concussion, he often looks fine. Those players or coaches or managers who've never had a concussion before simply do not understand why an otherwise seemingly healthy individual can't play. There is incredible pressure on some players to play through concussion. The players with concussions themselves are sometimes the guys that are putting the most pressure on themselves and putting themselves at risk by forcing to play. The sad truth is we know concussion protocols in the NHL are maybe not followed as often as they should be, especially in the playoffs. You see a guy laying unconscious on the ice one night, a few nights later, he's back in the lineup. Even today in the NHL, concussion is still a dirty word. So many teams refuse to say it, thinking if they don't utter it, it hasn't happened. They call them concussion-like symptoms without saying it's a concussion. And now there's the issue of headshots in the NHL. The league maintains it is possible for a player to deliver a clean, legal check by driving the shoulder into another player's head. But I'm of the opinion that this is lunacy. It wasn't always that way, and Hall of Famers such as Henri Richard and Bobby Orr have told me so. I don't think it should be that way now. No one wants to see hitting taken out of the game of hockey, and there's always the danger of incidental contact to the head. But as the NHL rules currently exist, there is no question in my mind some players are targeting other players' heads and getting away with it. At a time when most of the leagues out there, the Ontario League, the NCAA, international hockey, and even minor hockey, have head-checking penalties, the NHL does not, and they don't intend to anytime soon. Now, thankfully, the league is now starting to suspend flagrant shots to the head that are clearly outside of the rules, but it's still not enough. This is a relatively recent phenomenon in hockey. It wasn't a problem like this in the 70s and 80s, and we have to work hard to change it. But change does not come easily in the NHL, where the machismo game is held sacred. All I can tell you is that my own personal experiences with my kids has had a profound impact on how I view concussions. And if you talk to the players at any level who have been concussed, who have been enveloped by that blackness I talked about, who have lived the nightmare of not knowing when or if they'll get better or if they'll ever play again, well, they know only too well of what I speak. And I really do fear we don't even know the half of it in terms of the long-range implications of this issue. So at the risk of being branded a crusader, a pain-in-the-ass do-gooder, I can tell you that I have no plans whatsoever to stop waging this battle. It is, as far as I'm concerned, the most serious issue in sports today, both amateur and professional. And we must continue to heighten the awareness and do whatever is necessary to reduce the incidence of it. I'd like to thank Karen, Dr. Karen Johnson for all her help over the years and for her support and for the opportunity to address all of you today. I'm sorry I couldn't do it in person, 
but I'm away watching my son play hockey this weekend, and for that, I must tell you, I'm extremely grateful. My experiences with my sons have taught me not to take anything for granted. I suggest you do the same. These concussion road shows are an excellent way to spread the word, to fight the good fight, keep up the good work, because I certainly plan to do the same. Have a great day. Very good. The Beach. Indulge in a fantasy weekend of pampering and pleasure. Living the life. Monday at 9.30 Eastern on Travel and Escape.